She's the first Latina woman to be elected to the top spot on the LA City Council, and now she's planning out her big plans to transform the city of Los Angeles. I'm joined here in Studio City by City Council President Nuri Martinez. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. All eyes on you right now, right? In so many ways. Uh, let's talk about the most recent thing that has happened. The City Council just voted on an ordinance that would temporarily ban private companies from building or running migrant detention centers. Uh, that was one of your first projects right out the gate. You led this effort. Why is it important? Well, first of all, I think some of the children that are being held in these detention centers, you know, have um, suffered so much. And the fact that a private company would be benefiting from the pain and suffering of children is just immoral on so many different levels. And this company is looking at building a, uh, I'm sorry, opening a facility in my district in the community of Arlita. So we started this work a couple of months ago when we heard that this company was interested in coming in. So there's been a lot of support on behalf of the community to try to stop them from coming in. The Trump administration has given this company $25 million to open two detention centers in the state of California. And so one of the communities they're looking at opening one up is in, in my community, in, in the community of Arlita. And we just need to do everything possible to ensure that, first of all, these children should be reunited with their families to begin with. There, we now know there's about 1,500 children that were separated from their families. Um, this administration has lied about the numbers. Um, they've also now admitted that they have no real way of tracking these kids and reuniting them with their families. Some of them have already been adopted by American families. They probably will never see their parents ever again. That should not be the case. And any detention center or holding center or whatever you want to call it, to me it's still a prison. You're imprisoning minors and you're jailing them and preventing them from actually being reunited with their family. And that should be the objective, not separating them from their parents. So when you thought about this approach to this, uh, did you know that the city could pass an ordinance to stop private companies like this? Yes, we do. We have a lot of land use power in terms of the permitting process that it takes to open up a business or build any type of building in the city of Los Angeles. So we do have the power of land use authority um, in the city of Los Angeles. So we need to utilize those tools that we have to try to prevent these um, detention centers from opening up in any of our neighborhoods. But we're currently, um, the interim control ordinance that I introduced yesterday, that's just simply put a pause on allowing this facility to come in, but we're actually adopting an ordinance in the next couple of months to make it, um, to ban any type of this facility from ever entering or operating in the city of Los Angeles. So while that ordinance makes its way through the city council, this ICO was important for us to just pump the brakes and say, wait a minute, we're not going to allow this for now until the ordinance make, makes its way through the city council. Very interesting. We will be following that. Another yeah. issue that's a part of your Family First initiative is the homelessness yeah. crisis that continues to grow. Uh, in our city, you've said that you want to reevaluate how the city deals with it. How so? Well, you know, the numbers are, are shocking. You know, if, if we rely on the numbers that came out last year, in fact, we're, do, we're doing a homeless count as, as we're speaking. Right. Um, it so started we'll find out, two days yeah. ago. But last year's numbers were incredibly revealing. There's about one third of a homeless population are women. Women who are living on the street, women who are uh, fear for their lives, possibly being assaulted physically and sexually. And so the trauma behind that um, is something that none of us should tolerate. And so we need to do everything humanly possible to deal with families uh, and children, and particularly women and kids. Like what are we doing to prevent them from becoming homeless to begin with? And then what are we doing to be able to um, track whether they're about to become homeless so that we can find preventative measures so that they don't end up on a sidewalk in a car or in a motel. That's usually what happens to women and children. You're given a, a motel voucher and then every couple of days or months you're switched out because the voucher expires at that motel. So I think we need to prioritize family and children and ensure that they take try priority in housing them and then preventing them to be, from becoming homeless to begin with. So one of the issues that uh, your fellow councilman Mitch O'Farrell suggested is to use the St. Vincent Medical Center, mm -hmm. the hospital which is now going to be closed because of bankruptcy, as a homeless shelter. What do you think about that? That's one of the more creative solutions that we've heard. Well, I'm familiar with uh, St. Vincent's Hospital because I've driven by there so many times. It's right off of Alvarado. It's in Mitch's district. There's also, from what I hear, talks within the county of Los Angeles. Supervisor Solis is also looking at 
what can possibly, what kinds of homeless services that hospital can provide. So we need everything. I think the county provides mental health services and addiction services, and they need to continue to do that, and we need more of it as a matter of fact. The city of Los Angeles is in the business of building housing, and we also need to be making sure that we're meeting our goals to house our our homeless population. So I think there's a role for everyone to play, including the state and the governor, who just announced um, you know, over $600 million of dedicated mm -hmm. funds for this homeless um, crisis in the state of California. So there's room for everyone. Everyone needs to do their part, and we all need to be coordinating our efforts so that we can get to folks sooner rather than later and prevent homelessness from occurring to begin with. Yeah, and another issue that's also part of your Family First initiative is helping foster youth yeah. get jobs by encouraging local businesses to hire them. How would you do that? So for foster youth in particular, they're expected to figure out their lives by the time they turn 23. So these kids have probably been passed around so many times. By the time you age out of the, the, um, the foster care system, you're 23 years old and you're expected to have already figured it out. Have a job. Um, if you got any type of education or went to a four-year university, hopefully you have a job or you landed a job. And rent is so expensive in Los Angeles, the average two-bedroom apartment is $2,500 a month. And so can you imagine that burden on a 23-year-old who probably didn't grow up with his, his or her parents? And the fact that we expect them to turn out to the real world and figure it out is just not realistic. And so many of our youth are ending up on the streets because they simply don't have um, life figured out by the time they're 23 years old. In fact, a lot of adults don't. And so right. my fear is that we're not allowing those those young people to really, um, I would like for them to enter into the city's work uh, work pipeline. How are we exposing them to city jobs? They're middle, they're middle class jobs, they're good paying jobs with pensions and health care benefits. How do we ensure that those kids see themselves as future City of Los Angeles employees? Are we making it easy for them to understand how the civil servant um, exam, for example, that, that takes place every couple of months in the City of LA? How do we prepare them to take that exam so that they can become city employees? Our folks are aging out too. People are retiring and we have to backfill those jobs somehow. I would like our foster youth to have a first shot um, and anybody who sees themselves as perhaps a sanitation worker. Those guys make pretty good money. There's nothing wrong with working for the sanitation department. And how do we prepare you so that you can become the next, you know, the next workforce for the city of LA? That's what I'd like to see for our young people. And this issue is less talked about, but we do have one of the largest uh, uh, foster populations yeah. in the country. That's right. Um, I'm, I want to give you a chance to talk about some of the other issues that you care about because you have again, come out the gate pretty strongly and have been very active in um, doing something about these issues. What else is really important to you in this position? I think, of first of all, my Family First agenda includes all families. Our families look very different. Um, it, it includes LGBT families. It includes, you know, people who are working poor, for example, that sometimes I think they do everything they can, wake up every morning, go to work, and they're just barely getting by. And we see that so many so often by so many of our constituents that sometimes you're holding two jobs and you simply still cannot make the rent every month. That's um, heartbreaking and those folks are a catastrophe away from becoming homeless, you know, an emergency away from ending up on the streets. Somebody gets hurt, somebody ends up in the hospital, somebody dies. You are going to, you know, if you have not figured out your savings account, if you don't have a backup plan, you will most likely end up on the street. So those are the preventative measures that I was talking about earlier. But the other thing I want to also talk about that includes um, my family first agenda is parental leave. Mm. You know, our workforce was created over 40, 50 years ago where women were not expected to go to work. Women stayed home and raised their kids. Men went to work every day. That's, that's changed <laughs> through the last couple of decades. So I want to ensure that we have a paid parental leave um, ordinance in place um, later this month, I'm sorry, later this year, to ensure that families who choose to have children or adopt kids don't have to choose between their paycheck and bonding with their babies. I talked about my personal experience of dealing with postpartum depression after I had my daughter 10 years ago, and it'll be 11 years um, next month, and the difficulty was for me to go back to work. Women suffer, uh, whether it's emotional or physical trauma after you give birth, I think people need the adequate time to be able to stay home with their children and not have to rush back to work because you simply can't afford to have that time off to bond with your baby. Particularly women or families who are you know, low-wage low workers, for example. There's no difference between me as a mom and a waitress 
who's making a minimum wage job, probably that restaurant doesn't provide a leave program for her to be able to stay home for you know two or three months to bond with her baby. There, there's no difference between her and I. We're still women. We went probably went through the same experiences. I want to ensure that every family that chooses to bring a baby into their home has the adequate time to be able to dump bomb with their baby. I think it's other countries are doing it. I think in the United States we have not evolved in that way and we need to ensure that we prioritize families moving forward. And something that connects to what you're talking about now is you've talked about uh, raising gender equality in the workplace um, and of course yeah. you know because of your unique position that might be something that people will look to you in particular. How do you plan on doing that? You know to me when I was growing up you know, girls that look like me and talk like me didn't dream to ever becoming an elected official, let alone the president of the LA City Council, the second largest city in the country. And so to me, it's always about exposing young girls, especially women of color. How do we expose them to the, the careers that perhaps they didn't grow up, you know, emulating because no one ever exposed them to? So in, in the city family, we have general managers, head of sanitation, our head of street services, our head of street lighting. These are all powerful positions that move a lot of money and actually provide services for our, our residents in Los Angeles. I want to give women an opportunity to see themselves as the future general manager of public works, of this future general manager of the Department of Sanitation. And so I think it's important for us to hold our general managers accountable in, in asking them what are you doing for gender equity um, in your department and how are you making sure that women um, are getting an opportunity into those leadership positions so that they can be uh, groomed to become, you know, the first, you know, female general manager of the Department of Sanitation. We need to do that, um, not only for the women that are currently working for the city, but for generations to come of little girls so that they can see themselves as future council presidents of the city council, council women. Uh, we haven't elected the first woman um, mayor in the city of Los Angeles. We still haven't elected our first um, female governor in the state of California. We have a lot, of, a lot of work to do in terms of gender equity, but I think it starts with little girls seeing role models um, and, and emulating that as they grow up and they see themselves as, as that powerful woman heading that department in the future. Certainly a lot on your plate, so we're looking forward to see what the, canc the council is able to do this year with you at the helm. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.